Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Non-Fiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation. Hello and welcome to this episode of Read Smart, the official podcast for the Bailey Gifford Prize for Non-Fiction. My name is Toby Mundy and I'm the director of the prize. We're speaking today to Christopher Clark, the Regis Professor of History at Cambridge, who's been shortlist of this year's prize with the Revolutionary Spring, Fighting for a New World, 1848 to 1849. It's published in the UK by Alan Lane and in the US by Crown. Revolutionary Spring captures the turbulent sequence of events that erupted in this extraordinary year, 1848, where new leaders and new beliefs, new political questions and new expectations all came to the fore. Christopher's book is a brilliant and panoramic reappraisal of one of the most dramatic years in European history. Welcome, Christopher. Uh, thank you for coming and congratulations on being shortlisted for this year's award. Thank you so much, Toby. I'm delighted to be here. There's so much to talk about in this book, um, and I will try, if I can, to do it justice. Um, in January 1848, a poster appeared on a wall in Palermo in Sicily. And can you tell us why that poster was significant and what it gave rise to? Yes, the, the, the poster was, was a bizarre apparition. It, it appeared on the walls of the city of Palermo in Sicily, the capital city of Sicily, which was then part of a strange polity called the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, which combined the island of Sicily with the continental part of Italy around the city of Naples. And this poster effectively announced that in a few days, on the 12th of January, there would be a revolution. It said, you know, Sicilians, you will soon be free. The moment has arrived for your liberation. On the 12th of January, there will be a revolution. And it was signed Revolutionary Committee. And everybody thought, oh my goodness, there's there's a revolutionary committee. They've organized a revolution. What's going on? How extraordinary. But it was also puzzling. Why would a secret organization that had planned a, a revolution, why would it telegraph its intentions in this way to the authorities who naturally tripled the strength of the troops manning the city and patrolling the city streets? And so on the 12th of January, the troops all turned up. Uh, there was the, the, the morning passed with no revolution because in fact, there was no revolutionary committee. No revolution had been planned. But the poster sufficed to bring enough people onto the streets to ensure that during the day a clash broke out between the crowds and the armed troops. And the result was the beginning of a revolution. So the revolution effectively was started by uh, a, a kind of prank announcing a revolution which had not been planned. It's astounding. It's absolutely astounding. And what was the consequence of this uh, the, all these people took to the streets in Sicily, and, and what was the effect of this? Well, the really amazing thing is that this revolution was successful at all, because you know, the the suddenly crowds were fighting troops everywhere. Barricades went up in that classic 1848 way, uh, all across the city. Um, uh, the troops were in many places found themselves pinned down under under fire from armed citizens, squadrons, squadre as they were called, of armed peasants turned up from the surrounding countryside. Uh, the situation got hotter and hotter, and eventually the Neapolitan army was obliged to withdraw and leave the island to its own devices. And so the island then formed its own provisional government and uh, in, in due course acquired a, a, a parliament of its own and, and passed into this new sort of post-revolutionary state, all on the back of this poster, which had been uh, put up there by a kind of prankster called Bagnasco, who had nothing to do with any kind of revolutionary committee. <laughs> and... Um... It's not as uh, it's not as if the the king was short of troops, though. How did uh, why did they crumble so quickly? Well, they crumbled partly because cities are very difficult to control, even if you're troops and so on. I mean, they had safe places; they had fortresses and citadels that they could withdraw into. But um, but that that isn't the same as controlling a city. If the citizenry control everywhere except a few strongholds, um, you can't really say that it's still under the control of the authorities and. The, the the strongholds began to run short of food and drink, and uh, and teams were sent out to, to provision them. But of course, those teams come, came under fire as they approached the strongholds, and so people started you know losing their lives just to sustain the troops in their in their bastions. And so after a few weeks, the government basically it's it often happens with revolutions. I mean, they begin in a way be, often because regimes have already lost confidence in themselves, and that was the case in. In Naples, and the Neapolitan regime just decided to throw the towel in. They said, well, "There's nothing more we can do here. We've got to pull out of the island and 
they stayed in a, the city of Messina, where they had a very good coastal citadel that could be supplied from the sea, but they had to give up most of the rest of the island. And this was a pretty big event, but something much bigger happened six weeks later in February 1848 in, in Paris, didn't it? Which was well, the best part of a thousand kilometers away or more, I should think. Um, what, what happened there? Absolutely. Well, of course, it was the best part of a thousand kilometers away, as you say. But on the other hand, the French press had reported in great detail on what was going on in Palermo. And then, of course, Palermo, having gone up, you know, Naples soon found itself under pressure and the king was forced to promise a constitution. And, you know, things began to roll there as well. The news of this uprising in the south of Italy uh, was was filling the the columns, of, especially of the left-wing press in Paris. And enormous excitement was building around this. And at the same time, um, it, it was anticipated that a, a large banquet that was going to be held in one of the most turbulent areas of Paris, the 12th arrondissement, was going to be the occasion for a major demonstration against the government. And uh, made anxious by the news from Sicily and other parts of Italy and other parts of Europe, um, and keen to stop this banquet from exploding in their faces, the government banned the banquet, which turned out to have been the worst thing they could possibly have done. And then something a bit similar to Palermo happened. I mean, the banquet was banned, so there was no um, manifestation at which to in which to take part. But crowds turned up anyway to see what was going to happen. The troops had been reinforced because that was the day of the banned banquet. And again, it was a clash between troops and citizens that kicked this thing off. And one of the one of the great um, personalities of the French of the French Revolution of February 1848, a man called Alphonse de Lamartine, who became a member of the provisional government, later commented on the curious quality of spontaneous combustion huh. that that seemed to attend. He said, "You know, it's as if the curio the curiosity of the crowd that a revolution might be about to start sufficed to start one." <laughs> um, and you mentioned that um, the Parisians and the uh, were aware of the events in Sicily thanks to the the press. Tell us a little bit about the role of the press and what they, in this, at this time, um, and, and, and indeed the degree to which people were sort of literate and reading and that there was the beginnings of a, a continental-wide polity and, and what happened after the events in Paris? Well, first, I mean, the revolutions all have a similar kind of, I mean, perhaps revolutions in general have a similar kind of what, what could you call it, sort of rhythm or choreography? I mean, they start with the violent um, achievement of a, of a revolutionary situation, which means facing down the, the troops or the, 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 the police of the government, of the authorities. And that happened in different places in different ways, often with quite um, high mortalities. I mean, in, in Berlin, for example, over 300 citizens lost their lives on the, during the barricade fighting of the night of the 18th of March. And what followed in Paris, as almost everywhere else, was uh, on the next day the formation of a of a provisional government, but I mean even that was an incredibly haphazard process. I mean, who in a revolutionary situation decides who is going to form the government? There's no parliament to to make that decision. Uh, there's no there's nobody. You know, how do you nominate ministers? And in fact, what happened in Paris was you know almost comical in its in its improvised quality. You know, t two newspaper staffs basically got together and drew up a kind of improvised list of ministers. And this was read out to a large crowd at the Hôtel de Ville, which is one of the main theatres of revolutionary upheaval in the city. And the crowd, you know, cheered for some names and booed for others. And when there were boos for some names, those names were taken off. And then someone called out, Oi, what about my friend Mr. Albert? He, he was very brave. He, he killed some guards. Uh, and they said, yeah, yeah, Mr. Albert, he, sh he should be on the list. And so they added this man, Albert, to, um, to, to the list of ministers. Um, and, and, and then you had, the, you had the provisional government. And from that moment, that was the government. So, you know, one of the things that I got very interested in as I was writing about this, this um, revolution is that these processes are, you know, they, they place people on a kind of very perilous threshold in the face of a completely unknown future. And they're just making it up as they're going along. And that's part of the fascination of the, of, of the revolutionary situation. And you say that you say that the revolutions at one point of eighteen forty eight were not neither directly linked nor independent of each other. What do you, what do you mean? By yeah, that? yeah. Well, I mean, I was trying to get because if you if you look at them, if you kind of become the prisoner of maps and you you look at maps and then you sort of think of them in a time lapse series, then it does look as if waves of revolution are proliferating across the continent. So it looks a bit like a domino effect, but it's not quite as straightforward as that. Partly because, in fact, the waves are moving in many different directions. Uh, there, there are many different centers which are affecting the areas around them. So in Italy, the events in 
Palermo were very important, but so were events in Rome, for example. They radiated up and down the, the peninsula. Um, the whole of Europe was very interested in what had happened the year before in Switzerland, where there'd been a civil war between liberal and conservative cantons. So that that had pricked everybody's ears. And so I suppose what I what I meant was that you know um, it's not that the revolutions caused each other; it's that Europe as a whole was ready for revolution, which was poised for revolution, and that was why Banyasco had posted his poster. He said that you know he'd done this because he he felt that. Sicilians were so ready to rise up that uh, that even that just this prank might suffice to kick something off, and he was right; it did. And elsewhere too, the the cause the causes of the revolutions in many places seem to be trivial compared to the size of the events that they kick off. So we have to uh, then infer from that that th this is a continent that was on a, on a continental scale; it was ready for some form of upheaval. Acknowledging this means also acknowledging how connected Europe was in 1848. This is something that's easily forgotten because, you know, we we think of Europe as a sort of uh, as, a, as an assemblage of silos, national nation state silos. Um, but that's not how it was in 1848. You know, these liberal elites were extremely transnational. Um, they knew a lot more about each other's countries than European elites do today. Um, and you know, they were they were very connected up and very interested in what was going on in other states. And in addition to that, there were problems, in particular social problems uh, and forms of social distress that were continental in scale and that were not afflicting this nation state or that territory, but were afflicting the continent as a whole, such as that the hunger caused by the very poor harvest of 1846-47 and the downturn in the business cycle that kicked in in the spring of 1848. Well, that, that's what I was going to ask you, actually, that... Um the um, the world before the events of 1848, this was not an easy time to be alive unless you were particularly prosperous, was it? No, it's a very, very tough time. And, um, you know, a, 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 an economy marked by a growing population, um, but by very low levels of demand for um, for manufactured goods. So it's very, the real value of wages was declining in most sectors. That was eating into people's, the quality of people's lives. Uh, and although food as a whole was not in shortage, I mean, globally speaking, the, 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 the total amount of food produced was probably increasing by about twice the rate of the population. The, the population was surging. It, it rose by about 50% in the period between 1800 and 1848, but the food supply rose by about 100%. So this is not a Malthusian crisis where the, the continents are starving, but it was a situation very vulnerable to short-term uh, shocks. And what you had in 1846-47 was a sudden uh, and appalling harvest. And added to that, of course, the, t the potato blight, which, as we know from the case of Ireland, you know, caused a, a terrible famine, uh, resulting in the death of over an eighth of the population of the island of Ireland uh, and the emigration of hundreds of thousands of others. Um, but in throughout Europe, the, the northern Europe in particular, which was very potato dependent, the potato blight forced people to look for alternative foods, and that kicked prices up right across the, the sort of spectrum of different grains and foodstuffs. So you're looking at people who are right on, already right on the edge, and then short-term shocks can push them over into crisis. And when these revolutions came in their different places and their different guises, um, the revolutionaries themselves were a pretty disparate bunch, weren't they? And very quickly fell, as, as you said earlier, to sort of falling out amongst themselves. Give us a, a sense of the currents within those revolutionary movements, if you can, please. Yes, yes, I will. I mean, the first thing worth saying here is that, you know, the revolutions, I mean, the, the prank in, in Palermo is a good example. The revolutions were planned and brought about by revolutionaries. They, they were tsunami-like um, movements of the societies of Europe um, or of European society. Um, they weren't the result of underground conspiracies which had sort of plotted a, an assault on the centers of power. Um, there is one of the revolutions which is a bit like that, but that only happens in the summer in, in Wallachia and in what we now call what, Romania. But the rest of them, you know, the revolutionary, the, uh, revolutionaries are actually those who pick up the pieces once the revolution has happened and say, you know, we can take charge of this. Um, but they're not the ones, they're not the people who had brought the revolution about. So um, consequently, they're, they're also struggling to find their way and they have to improvise um, a path through all this tumult which they all do. And in many cases, they do it with, with admirable courage and aplomb. But 
what what quickly emerges is that the euphoric unanimity of the early hours, the early days and weeks of the revolution, where everybody feels it's, it's you know their a sense of immersion in a collective self, and a marvelous sense of connectedness with all other um, citizens. There's a lot of descriptions of people embracing each other in tears. People, strangers, they you know from a very different social um, location. You know, poor people embracing um, you know arist- uh, members of the aristocracy and so on. Um, all that passes, and what's left once the all the euphoria is gone is a kind of hangover in which everyone realizes that the different streams of the revolution are not striving for the same vision and that people have very divergent and conflicting ideas of what they want to do with this situation. And I mean, there are many different fault lines, but one of the most important is the one between people who want to politically tweak the system by slightly or more substantially expanding the franchise by convening a parliament if there isn't one already. I mean, there already is a French parliament, but by convening it again under a broader franchise uh, or creating a parliament where there's none, as in Prussia or Piedmont, um, by you know drafting a constitution, by uh, improving protections of the citizenry, the protections of property, and so on. So these are people we might call liberals, people who want to make political tweaks to the system, freedom of the press, that sort of thing. And you say, you say in your book that they rejected the privileges of birth but affirmed the privilege of wealth. Yes, because they said, you know, wealth is not a privilege, my friend. You have to earn wealth. Well, I mean, nobody seems to have told them that most wealth is inherited, but in any case, uh, rather than earned. But in any case, their, their reply would have been, well, it was earned by whoever earned it. I mean, um, if, even if you personally haven't earned it, uh, your grandfather did, or your great, great, great grandfather, and so on. So that was their, their, and they liked the French Revolution of 1789, but they didn't like the radical Jacobin French Revolution of 1793. So the Liberals are always people of, you could call them people of the thus far, but no further. They, whereas the, whereas the, on the left, you had people who wanted the revolutionary situation to create opportunities to register the social needs of people who were in dire straits. And I mean, I was just listening, um, to the, uh, actually, am I allowed to mention another podcast? Is that okay? Other podcasts do exist and are available. You must. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I was listening just this morning, in fact, to Gideon Rachman's uh, Rachman Review, and he was talking to an expert on African affairs called Comfort Aero, and he asked her, have Africans lost faith in democracy? And he said, no, they haven't lost faith in democracy. It's just that by democracy, they mean, they say by democracy, they mean not just, you know, the right to vote and to do other things uh, and the, the protections of a constitution and the existence of a parliament. They mean, you know, the right to live a dignified life a life which is adequately resourced. And they say, you know, what use are rights to me if I can't eat them? And this is exactly the argument that was made in 1848. People said, what use is the freedom to read if I don't have the freedom to feed? You know, Pressefreiheit, Fressefreiheit, the African, the um, the radicals in Germany used to, used to make this play with the two words, the freedom of the press and the freedom to feed. So, you know, um, it was a bit like Isaiah Berlin's question. What do I give the Egyptian peasant? Do I give him liberty or do I give him boots? And there were people on the left who said, you know, some boot, we'd like some boots, please. Uh, liberty is not going to suffice. And so the, these two very broad strands, the radicals and the liberals, the radicals were focused more on uh, what they called the social question. Weren't they? So tell us a bit more about what those debates around the social question were for the radicals. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know how moral panics can sort of seize hold of a of an entire media world. You know, we we have one at the moment about social media and 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 so on. Well, the social question was the great moral panic of the eighteen forties, and it was a, a whole bundle of questions about you know what in what ways does working in a factory affect your health, especially if you've had to do so since you were four years old. Um, and there were vast treatises, you know, examining weavers, for example, silk weavers in Lyon, and arguing that they had. A, a, a curious gait, be, which could be recognised from 400 metres away, because they had been effectively partially crippled by their by their many years of work at the looms, uh, and also they had they often had a, a very bad cough because they were constantly breathing in silk fibres, which is very bad for your lungs. And that was part of it. You know, occupational illnesses, um, the effects of what what now in Britain is called bed poverty: too many children in too few beds, or people of different generations having to share the same beds, even from different families, concerned about incest, concerned about you know uh, sexual relations between the generations, and uh, the concern about what, um, a concern about crowded dwellings uh, and, and about disease. So 
and about the decline of religion and about the rise of vice. And I mean, the list was endless. I mean, every form of social dysfunction was wrapped up into this thing called the social question. And people worried about it. And of course, the answers they proposed to the social question were very different. Some said that we needed more de deregulation. They tended to be the liberals. Conservatives said we needed to return to the old ways with, uh, with, with feudalism and mutual responsibility and people bound in guild-like structures that would protect them against the vicissitudes of the market. And people like socialists said, you know, we need the state to intervene and protect people against the sinking of wages and the rising of prices. And it, across Europe, these these uh, divergent groups um, found themselves in newly conceived parliaments with newly conceived constitutions where they realized just how little they agreed with each other. Is that fair to say? Yes, absolutely. They, 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 they kept realizing... Um, uh, I mean, every day was a new, a new and nasty surprise about how new things to disagree about. Let's put it that way. And one big shock to the left in particular was that, you know, they had joined with the liberals in in calling for an expansion of the franchise, and they wanted a, you know, a virtually universal franchise. No one was pleading, by the way, for the enfranchisement of women. This was an entirely male political universe. Um, there were advocates for women's rights. Uh, they were almost exclusively female. So women were advocating very intelligently and energetically for their own cause, but men were not great allies to the cause of women at, the, at this point. But in any case, leaving the women aside for one moment, um, radicals had pleaded, uh, uh, pled, sorry, radicals had pled alongside liberals for an expansion of the franchise. But when this franchise expansion was carried out and when parliaments were elected, this was a tremendous existential disappointment to the left. Because in most of these assemblies, the left got uh, only returned a minority of deputies, and um, this was—I mean—they responded to this a number of ways. Some hard leftists said, "Right, that's it. I've had enough of parliaments. Parliaments are rubbish. They're just chit-chat shops, and I'd rather lead another insurrection." That's what one man called Friedrich Hecker in the in the in the Grand Duchy of Baden led a completely failed uh, insurrection against the authorities after um, he grown tired of parliamentary you know, chit-chat. Um, others tried to keep the conversation going with their opponents um, and you know, continue to all the hard work of building compromise with people who really fundamentally disagree with you. Uh, and so it went on. It was the usual difficult stuff of politics. And as, as the revolutionaries fought and bickered amongst themselves and tried to operate the new machineries of government that they were inventing, the forces that they had deposed, the conservative forces and the forces of reaction, were able to recover themselves, weren't they? Absolutely. I mean, and this is one of the curious things about the revolution, but it's a sort of warning about revolutions and political movements in general, is that they had created the impression, they had generated the impression that uh, of ubiquity. People thought that you know, there was no part of life that hasn't been touched and transformed by this revolution. But that was a view you could take if you lived in one of the sort of inner city areas of Paris, for example. The revolution was all around you. But um, people often found that once you left the big cities and went out to quiet rural locations, you, you might even bump into people who'd never even heard that the revolution had happened. I mean, that, that, that has been known to. There are contemporaries who record this. And so it was always possible for those who, who didn't like the, rev the revolution and remained committed to stopping it or to, to preventing its further evolution, it was always possible for them to withdraw into sort of quiet zones and to recharge their battery sort of far away from the, from the, from the fray. And, you know, the Habsburg monarchy, the Austrian monarchy is a marvelous example of that. The, the Habsburg court kept on sort of upping stakes, packing its bags and leaving Vienna and going to various more bucolic locations where they could sort of sit things out and also plan and strategize and um, work out what to do next. Did they take flight so readily because they because of the ghost of um, the French Revolution, seventeen eighty nine? I, th I think the French monarchy fled the country because of that, um, and there, you know, one has to remember that you know um, this was a monarchy that had a very vivid memory of the events of seventeen eighty nine to to eighteen fifteen, in particular the Jacobin dictatorship, the execution of the king, and um, and you know the the king's decision to flee. I think had to do with that traumatic memory of all that violence. Of the revolution, um, he had himself fought in the revolutionary armies of France, so he had, he knew whereof he spoke. I mean, he he'd been part of that general scenery. So, um, 
Yes, I think the memory of the French Revolution was important for them. I think in the Habsburg case, it's more complicated. The Habsburgs, it's a vast multi-ethnic commonwealth extending over much of Central Europe. It's where the sort of the Czechs, the people we now call the Czechs, the Croats, the Slovenes, the Serbs, the, you know, you name it, the Romanians, the Hungarians, they all lived inside this massive apron of territory. And in that situation, um, it, it made sense for the for the um, Habsburg court in Vienna just to sort of say, well, we'll leave the city. Things are heating up in the city. They'll be much quieter in Bad Ischl or in Olomotz in, in Bohemia. So we'll pop over there and, and let things, you know, and, and sit things out. That looked at the time. I mean, in, in Vienna, when the, when the court left, people you know, rejoiced and thought, that's it, we've won, they've left now. That was a mistake. That was a bit like people, a bit because their departure was actually a bit like the withdrawal of water before a, a tsunami along a beachfront. You know, the water pulls out and you think, oh, how quiet it's all become. There are no waves. And of course, that's because one gigantic big wave is building, but it's in the distance. And similarly, when the court left Vienna, it was actually not a sign of the weakness of the Habsburg monarchy. It was a sign of one of its strengths, namely that it could move around, go into peripatetic mode, like the monarchy of Charlemagne, and, and shift locations and simply rebuild its forces in another place and then come back to settle its house, you know, put its house in order. But those forces that they were rebuilding included uh, some Russians, didn't they? There's an extraordinary moment in the book where uh, um, Franz Josef, Emperor Franz Josef, of the Habsburgs is in Warsaw, in the presence of, Z of Tsar Nicholas the First, isn't there? What tell us? Tell us what happened. Absolutely. Well, he does something absolutely extraordinary, um, which it, it's hard to imagine any any um, head of state because after all, he 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 he'd recently been um, placed on the throne. His his relative um, Ferdinand, though a very nice man that everybody liked, was was completely in, incapable and incompetent, and was removed. And this young man was very intelligent hadn't made any promises to the revolutionaries and was, was you know, uh, someone you could uh, build a new future with. He w went off to Warsaw, met with the Russian Tsar and fell to his knees in front of the Russian Tsar and kissed his hands. And this gave everyone very clear signals about, you know, um, the standing of the Russian Tsar. And uh, what followed was a request, you know, could you come in and help us to put this revolution down, which the Russians were very happy to do. With a huge um, army. With a huge army. Uh, and they went in for, they put the revolution down in Wallachia and Moldavia, and then they went through into into Hungary. Um, I mean, they they didn't play a central role in putting down the Hungarian revolution. The Hungarians, in effect, it was really the Austrian armies themselves, um, supported by other auxiliaries from within the Austrian Commonwealth, the, the Austrian em Empire, um, namely the, the, the Serbian and Croatian um, irregulars and the armies of Banja Lacic, the Croat leader, and so on. All of them got together and helped to bring down the Hungarians, but the the presence of the Russians was 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 crucial too. But the Russians the Russians didn't stay. They didn't. It never became incorporated into the Russian Empire, which I thought was rather interesting. No, the Russians didn't stay in Hungary. They pulled out. Um, they did stay for a while in Wallachia and Moldavia, but there was a lot of international tension around that because it was on the Black Sea coast, and um, it was on the mouth of the Danube. And the British were very concerned that no that that the Russians shouldn't disturb the passage of grain and other goods to the mouth of the Danube because British companies were involved in trading in that part of Europe on the Black Sea. Um, and so in the end, the, the Russians did pull out. Um, but but it was it's an example, I think, of something, you know, one of the tragedies of the revolution. And that was that the revolution had been very good at operating transnationally. It thought of itself as an international. Um, but the real international was the reactionary international. It was the the, the forces of the, the old monarchical states that succeeded best in coordinating with each other. They formed relatively trouble-free alliances. And of course, they had the huge advantage over the revolutions that they possessed armies. The The problem with the revolutionary movements was that they controlled the squares, as it were. If you think of, you know, Neil Ferguson's uh, book about the tower and the square, the tower being the sort of hierarchical chain of command based system, which deploy, which can project power and the square being the, the space of opinion, you know, horizontal, like, like Facebook or, or, X or whatever, you know, um, they, they, the revolutionaries are very good at, at, at infiltrating and controlling the squares, but of course they didn't control the towers. And one of the keys to the success of the counter-revolution was the fact that the armies by and large remained, lo remained loyal to their, to their commanders. And so by late 1849, um, less than two years after it all began, it was all over. The revolutionaries were crushed, as you say. Tower, you said, I think, you just, as you just said, and as you say in the book, towers prevailed over squares. Uh, 
hierarchies beat networks and power prevailed over ideas and arguments. But I want to talk to you a little, I want to talk a little bit more about the idea of the revolutions as a failure. But before I do so, a quick, quick detour, because you mentioned the British a moment ago. The Brits have sort of congratulated themselves that nothing of this kind happened here. But in fact, that's not entirely true, is it? Not quite. I mean, I remember when I was a kid at school, uh, we, we did we did the 1840 revolutions. And I remember asking the teacher, uh, who was a wonderful teacher, actually, uh, it's one of the reasons why I'm sitting here right now. Um, he, um, I asked him, you know, why, why did Britain not have an 1848 revolution? And he said, uh, look, Britain was already so liberal, it didn't need one, which was interesting that, of course, that was exactly what the British press said. The British, the British tended to clap themselves in the back and say, well, of course, our European friends are, you know, do, you going to their usual gyrations because we're not going to do that because we, we already have the things that they're contending for. Um, that wasn't quite as straightforward as that. Um, first of all, I mean, everyone was surprised that Ireland remained quiet, but Ireland remained quiet for, uh, among other things, because the, the famine had wiped out, um, the country's ability to really do anything in the short, in the short term. And the British through a long, you know, protracted process of, of prosecutions and transportations had also removed a lot of key troublemakers. Quite a few of them had wound up in Australia. And in fact, the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, note, notes this in when it finally gets news of what's going on in Europe, which is about after about four and a half months down in the colony of New South Wales, they um, they notice this and they say, you know, they they ask why is it there there's such that there, there's sanguinary sanguinary chaos in the streets of Paris, but you know, uh, sweet tranquility reigns in the streets of London. And they said, well, the reason for this is that their troublemakers have been, you know, em- exported to the uh, to the outskirts of empire and namely here to Sydney. So. And, um, and so, you know, th- th- it's it's not so much that Britain doesn't have a revolutionary movement. I mean, the Chartist movement was one of the best organized and certainly largest and best funded um, movements of political challenge anywhere in Europe. Um, it's rather that, um, you know, good policing had, had deprived this movement of a lot of its ability to act. And another point here worth making is that throughout Europe, one thing that people noticed was that Britain was very robustly policed. It was the most efficiently policed country in Europe by some margin. And in the summer of 1848, the Prussians sent a fact-finding mission over to London, and then they spent a lot of time in Ireland examining the Irish constabulary, which they greatly admired, and returned to Berlin with lots of tips about how to make Prussian policing more British, um, and uh, with the idea that this would prevent future tumults. So Britain was not seen as just as a leader in, in its liberal institutions. It was also seen as, as a leader in muscular policing. And the, the final point is that in areas where the British did face a serious challenge, a sort of upheaval of the kind that you see in many parts of Europe in 1848, namely on the Ionian Islands, where they were the protector power, um, and in particular on the island of Kefalonia in 1849, where there was a sort of quite a violent rural revolt, they responded exactly as everybody else did. They responded like the Austrians, uh, or for that matter, like the Russians in uh, where, when they went into suppressed revolutions, or like the Prussians in Baden. They they hunted people down. They executed them. They shot them. They kicked open the doors of cottages. They set fire to crops. You know, uh, they did whatever they wanted basically in order to to punish these obstreperous rustics. This despite having a this despite having a, a liberal British governor, if I remember. Absolutely, and that was the really odd thing. They'd had a, a as a really seasoned old Tory of the of the sort of Wellington type. It'd been very good for the island. Uh, for the islands, for the Ionian Islands, and actually been very liberal in his actual practice, and then he was replaced by this man who was a, you know, a, an advanced from the advanced liberal faction, and he turned up, and uh, you know, um, with a far less patient personality, um, and you know, joined. It was reported that he had joined in when the when the military when the men went out to to you know chase brigands and capture you know revolutionaries and so on, and uh, he, he was at the front with them and kicking down cottage doors. And he witnessed the shooting of a few peasants who were trying to run away and, you know, all this kind of thing. So, you know, um, it, 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 there's nothing particular, I mean, it, of course, this is bad behavior, but there's nothing particularly nefarious about this in the European context. It just reveals that the British, when they did face this kind of um, upheaval, responded as as other European authorities tended to respond, namely with, with counter, with violence. Hmm. So the conventional account of these tumultuous um, months and, and years um, have been, I think, as you say, GM Trevelyan's words, this is the turning point where modern history failed to turn, that these events resulted in 
failure, but you demonstrate brilliantly that in fact that they left a complex and in some ways quite positive legacy, these revolutions. Yes, well, the failure thesis is something also that I was that I encountered when I first learned about these revolutions. And that was, again, this wonderful beloved teacher told us, you know, boys, these revolutions are complicated and they're a failure. And I remember thinking, well, that's a very unattractive um, combination. I, I don't plan ever to do any work on this because who would want to, you know, spend time on a complicated failure? But in fact, I mean, and indeed they were complicated. That uh, That's no reason to um, recalibrate that claim. But they were not a failure because, uh, they, nor were they a success. I mean, it's just that failure and success are the wrong binary for these revolutions, just as they're the wrong way of thinking about a massive snowstorm. We don't say, did, did Hurricane Katrina succeed or did it fail? Um, would be, an, uh, everybody would acknowledge it's a ridiculous question. Of course, to that, someone might object, well, hang on, that's a natural event. A revolution is a political event, which is true. And they might say, you know, a political event is driven by an intention. If the intention is fulfilled, that's a success. If it's not, that's a failure. But the problem is that a revolution is actually quite like a storm in the sense that it's full of many, many intentions and many, many forces. Some of them are progressive, some of them are very progressive, some of them are conservative or conservative liberal, and others are, are, are straight out reactionary. And so, you know, uh, you, to call it a failure, you'd have to, first of all, to specify who is failing and who is succeeding here. I mean, some people did succeed, uh, others most certainly failed, and those who were killed or wound up in exile or in prison you could say that their projects failed, even if they didn't as people. So, you know, it's a very complicated picture. And I don't think failure is the way to get hold of it. What we should ask is what were the consequences? How was the world different after these revolutions? Um, I love, by the way, the fact that you compare these revolutions to the Large Hadron Collider at one point, which I, <laughs> I thought was brilliant. People, groups and ideas flew into it and crashed together. Um, so what were the consequences if, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you could, write a whole book about the consequences as well. But what were some of the consequences? Well, it's, it's interesting you ask that because actually that's where the work for this book began. I, I, I really initially thought I wanted to to write, to sort of reappraise the consequences of the revolution because the term that was often used for the years after the revolution in the in the literature, especially the German language literature, was the, the decade of reaction or the era of reaction. And when I looked at what was happening, it seemed to me that didn't capture the vividness of what was going on. All sorts of things change after 1848. But first, the first thing to remember is that the revolutions uh, give rise to constitutions which have a very long afterlife. So, for example, um, Denmark had been was an absolute monarchy in 1848 when the revolutions broke out. And um, in order to avoid uh, having a revolution in their own streets, as it were, the, the court in Copenhagen agreed to summon uh, a, a constitutional commission. And the result was the constitution of the 5th of June, 1849, the so-called June Constitution, which whose who's, uh, promulgation, by the way, is still celebrated today as a national holiday in Denmark. It is still effectively the, the Danish national constitution. The constitution of Switzerland is still the constitution of 1848, drawn up after that civil war I mentioned before by the victorious liberal cantons. Um, the constitution of Piedmont became the constitution of the Kingdom of Italy after 1860. Um, Prussia got a new constitution. It had never had one before. And it got a parliament, which meant it also got you know, regular elections and uh, Hansard-like reports of parliamentary debates. So, you know, in many countries, this is a major point of departure where a new era is inaugurated, an era of political contestation, public debate, election campaigns, press coverage, and so on. Uh, so that's one change. And then another change, more subtle, but I think important, is a change in the style of government. Uh, in the 1830s and 40s, the style of government had been very rhetorical, um, big words, freedom, constitution, rights, bandied against other words, you know, duty, tradition, and so on. And a lot of shouting and, and in many places also shooting. I mean, shouting is bad enough, but shooting is even worse. Shouting and shooting. And in fact, there was a, there was a Portuguese um, statesman by the name of uh, Fonch Pereira de Melo, who said uh, in the mid-1850s when he was talking about the new post-revolutionary system of politics, which he called a new, a new politics. And he said, thank God we've left behind the era of shouting and shooting. And we've, we have a new post-revolutionary era, which is an era of tranquility and compromise. And this is something that many people observe right across Europe, that politics becomes more centrist. Suddenly you find left-wing people on the left of the liberal uh, parties getting together with people on the right of the conservative parties. Um, a sort of centrist or center-seeking coalitions 
uh, uh, driving through packages of reforms that gradually transform and modernize the the, the, the states of Europe uh, in very similar ways in all the different um, contexts because they're all watching each other as well. It's highly imitative and, and quite synchronized. And so you end up with, you know, administrative reform, a lot of restructuring of urban space in order to address the issues which had been driving the social question in the 1830s and 40s, um, a new approach to economic policy, more investment in infrastructure. Um, and this movement towards what, you, what I suppose you could call a kind of technocracy is an attempt to get away from the shouting and shooting. And people, I know that technocracy is not a very beautiful word in people these days where we're used to hearing people say, you know, using the word technocratic as a sort of, uh, as a kind of hate word. But in fact, technocracies sometimes arise as a preferable alternative to something worse, namely the violent, direct contention over certain goods or ideals. And technocracy is a way of saying, no, we're going to hand this process of contention over to experts, statisticians, experts on salubrious housing, urban planners, uh, people like that. And so you, 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 the 50s sees a kind of planification of government. It gets more planny. It gets more um, nerdy. It's the kind of it's a kind of revolution of the nerds, if you like, um, of, of the kind we saw we've seen since the 1990s. Well, indeed, I, and we'll, we'll, as we come to the end of this conversation, we might just come back to that. Um, before we do, um, Karl Marx pops up at various points in your book. I mean, what what lessons did he learn? Because his account of these years is very important. What lessons did he learn from this turbulence? Well, Marx was a hugely helpful sort of companion for me because, uh, and I don't mean here the Marx of Das Kapital, I mean, you know, or, or of the Grundrisse or of any of the great sort of formal works of theory, but the Marx, uh, uh, Marx as an observer of contemporary events. He was a, an incredibly intelligent and sharp-eyed analyst of events as they were happening. And, and some of his journalism is actually fresher than the theoretical writing. And there are some marvelous pieces he did together with Engels as well. They, they co-authored them. And what Marx, you know, learned from all of this was the, that that in the end, um, you know, societies are systems of force, and that uh, there's a marvelous piece that he and Engels write. I mean, marvelous from the point of view of clarifying our understanding of what kind of sense people could make of these revolutions, in which he and Engels say, you know, these revolutions have shown that the big words of the revolution, you know, family rights, constitution, liberty we're all, they're empty. They're only sonorous because like drums, they're empty. Um, and so we need to move to a theory which makes sense of actual force. And actual force and, you know, arises from economic circumstances. It resides in the structures of production. And the future will be made, will be driven, history will be driven by the interaction of these forces. And it won't matter what words people are using, these forces will be driving everything. So. The, the, the task of the political, the person who wants to understand politics is to turn to a, a scientific humanism, a scientific study of human affairs, uh, which became, of course, later on Marxism, though Marx famously claimed he wasn't a Marxist. Um, and then, you know, what's interesting about that is that Marx is not alone. I mean, you also have Bismarck saying, you know, the, the, the future of this country, the future of Germany will not be settled by the speeches of disgruntled parliamentary celebrities. It will be settled by blood and iron, and in a way, what Mar what Bismarck is saying is a slightly more brutal articulation of the same idea. It's going to be a matter of force, and forces are going to prevail over forces, and, and these big arguments about you know um, about issues of principle are going to w wind up being irrelevant. And in the middle, you have liberal figures like the man who invented the idea of realpolitik, a man called Rochow, who said that you know a society is just an assemblage of forces. And, um, and so, the, in other words, there's a turn from, uh, we see it also in the Italian elites, Dazzelio and others, you know, away from the, the kind of trumpeting or the sort of programmatic declaration of ideals and, and principled positions towards what you could call a kind of pragmatics of power, where the chief task of someone who wants to become politically active is to understand where power is, to manage resources, to, to balance demands. Uh, and to, you know, to to um, reconcile needs. Gosh, um, this is unfortunately the last question I have time for, really. But you you say um, towards the end, it's 175 years later. Um, you're struck by the feeling that the people of 1848 will be able to see themselves in us. What do you mean by that? 
Yeah, I, I mean, this wasn't part of my plan in writing the book. I didn't write it because I wanted to illuminate connections with the present, but they just they just kept on sort of, um, you know, uh, popping up into my awareness as I as I wrote the book because they were just they were just getting more and more numerous. I mean, just to give a couple of examples, you know, in eighteen in the eighteen forties and uh, leading it right up to the eve of the revolution, um, the question was being asked: Does our modern economic system actually generate inequality? Or is inequality, is poverty something we've inherited from the past, a kind of, you know, part of the human condition? Or is it something we're actually causing by the way we do things? And this is exactly the question Thomas Piketty, Piketty asked in recent years. And what's interesting about his answers is that it's not the question of whether you agree with his argument or not. And I know that there are, uh, there are you know, powerful critiques of his argument. But what's interesting is the global resonance, the, the global interest in Piketty's book uh, and the global the surge of global interest in the question of inequality. Or if you think about, which is again, a sort of an echo, echo with the period before 1848, or if you think about um, the problem which just identified on the BBC the other day as a, one of the central themes for social workers in Britain today, bed poverty. Um, you know, families that don't have enough beds where there are too many people in each bed. Or uh, the problem of the working poor, people who still are in work. I mean, it's not that they're unemployed. Unemployment right now is not the central problem. It's that people are not being paid enough for the things that they do. What they're being, what they're being paid does not suffice to enable them to have a dignified life in which they can plan for the future and, and supply their children with the opportunities that, that they deserve. So, you know, um, I mean, that's just a, a few examples. There are endless examples of the you know, in, in conflicts over resources, the return of the grain price shock, I mean, when I started work on this book, I've been thinking about 1848 for decades. And, you know, it seemed like the era of the grain price shock when the price of bread would suddenly go up was a, a, a thing of the very distant past. We seem to have got up over that. But now, mainly for geopolitical reasons and possibly increasing in the future for climate change reasons, we are seeing serious price shocks for the most basic stable goods. And this is, again, uh, and also for fuel, which was another problem. I mean, the struggle over fuel and wood in particular in 1848. We see it now around natural gas and, and fossil fuel, other fossil fuels. So, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which, you know, the, the mid-19th century world is kind of creeping, creeping up on us. And I, I, I don't mean by that, and I've had a sort of friendly argument with an American historian, David Bell, who I respect greatly and enjoy his books enormously. And he said, no, this, this is a very different situation because nobody believes in revolution anymore, whereas then they did. But that's not my point. I'm not saying that we can expect a revolution or that we're planning one. What I'm saying is that the, the period in between that separates us from them is something that we're coming to the end of. They hadn't yet started it. We're coming to its end. It's something I suppose we could call high modernity, marked by hyper-industrialization, uh, a form of industrialization that changed the physical environment, changed everybody's experience. Um, by the rise of national audiences for, for the key press organs, national newspapers, national radio audiences, national television audiences, by the ascendancy of the nation state. Uh, and all of these things are once again in flux now. And the hold of the great national parties, you know, the Christian Democratic Party, the, the Republican Party of the United States, one might even say, dare one say, the Conservative Party in this country. You know, there's a process of dissolution, of sort of melting that's going on. And the emergence in the place of these big, once very stable partisan formations that used to be anchorages for people's identities. They weren't just something you voted for. They were something you plotted your path by. And a lot of them are kind of melting away and fragmenting. And what's emerging in their place is all sorts of parties we don't really know. I mean, they seem like one-issue parties or one-issue movements, let's say, uh, Occupy Wall Street, the Gilets Jaunes, the Freedom Truckers in, in Ottawa, the, um, the Trump movement. Um, the so-called Querdenker, the lateral thinkers in Germany, anti-vaxxer movements, all sorts of things going on in, in the sort of pullulating world of the social media, um, which are uh, um, much more febrile, much more fragmented, much more decentered and, and difficult to read. And what the result is, you know, uh, we don't have any sense of the general direction of travel. And I think they didn't either. So my point is not, you know, hey, we're going to have another we're going to have a revolution. So it's not that. It's it's simply that, you know, we've returned to not being modern anymore. We've lost these disciplining agencies and we're exposed once again to forms of precarity that we thought had become part of the past for Western societies. And what's interesting is the discourses are so similar too. You think about the this sort of diagnostic, you know, discussion 
of an inequality today. And you hear people saying things like, you know, the, the life of the poor is terra incognita for the smart classes of Seattle or London or Paris or Vienna. But that's exactly what people were saying in the 1840s. They were saying, you know, they were talking about the mysteries of Paris, the mystery of Berlin. And what they meant by the mysteries was the places nobody goes to, full of dirty, uh, dirty squirming children in, in overcrowded beds and, uh, and people in, with, with no light living in dark, stinking holes, basically. Um, so we're, we're in a way where we are sort of, you know, re-entering a world of uncertainty, which is more like theirs, certainly than the world we've known um, in our own time. Well, that's quite a thought to end on. Um, thank you so much, uh, Christopher Clark, for a, a, a wonderful conversation and good luck with the next stage of the prize. Toby, thank you so much. Great questions and a, and a really fun conversation. Well, that's all we have time for today. We'd like, as always, to thank the Blavatnik Family Foundation for its continued and generous sponsorship of this podcast. The winner of this year's Bader Giffer Prize will be announced at an awards ceremony at the Science Museum, uh, also generously sponsored by the Blavatnik Family Foundation, on Thursday, the 16th of November. That winner announced what will be live streamed across the Bailey Giffer Prize for nonfiction some short media channels. If you're interested in finding out more about the shortlist or the prize in general, you can sign up for our newsletter on our website or follow us on the in the pollulating world of social media, as Christopher Clark calls it. That is to say, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, at BG Prize. Thank you for listening. See you again. Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation.